going to end up eating a steady diet of government cheese and living in a van down by the river. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, you'll learn how to avoid becoming miserably rich with founder and CEO of Sensible Money, Dana Onspock. Then, Stacking Benjamin's very own Scrooge, it's OG! And finally, the richest man in the world, it's... Oh, God, I'm sorry. That was a typo. It's just Len Penzo. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share my filthy rich trivia question. And now, a guy who hit the jackpot when he hired me, it's Joe Saul Cihai. Oh, God. Welcome to the Humble for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Bunny on Twitter. And we are going to have some fun today because we're going to talk about uh, avoiding becoming miserably rich. And let's start with the guy across the card table from me who feels wealthy every minute he spends with me, Doug. It's uh, Mr. <laughs> OG. How are you, dude? Like a uh, one-armed paper hanger, as Grandpa used to say. He was in the paper business. <laughs> but, Apparently, but, but, doing it one-handed was a pain in the butt. So you were really busy. Some of those old phrases, you're just like, yep, whatever. Uh-huh. Don't take any wooden nickels. Right. Like a three-legged dog and a flea-scratching contest. <laughs> no idea. Yes, all that. <laughs> And, and more. And the guy who is deep under Los Angeles, again joining us, Mr. Len Penzo is here. Len, how are you, my friend? I'm feeling wealthier. I'll tell you that. I got an email today from, and this is hilarious, I, it came across my inbox, from the LenPenzo.com HR department, which Uh-oh. I find oh. really interesting. No, <laughs> Those are never good. I'm an employee of one at, at this company, so but somebody from the HR department sent me an email telling me that I had a raise, and my raise, it was in the attachment in the email. If I just opened the attachment, I could see how much my raise was. So uh, I'll be opening that right after the show here, so I can't wait. Do so it live. Make up? sure you... Make sure you click on the links that are in there, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Very I safe. can't wait. This is I'm excited. Never knew you had a mystery employee, did you? No, I didn't. That's... But the HR department, I, I guess, exists. So, I uh, no, they always do. I thought, Len, you were beginning this with a joke, as <laughs> always. <laughs> like everybody's waiting for the Len Penzo joke. I, this really happened. It really happened. Yeah, it sure did. So great. The, the stuff. Cheryl last week uh, 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 came into the room and she's like, "What do you got coming from UPS?" I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, I just got a text that you got this UPS package. We got, I'm like, do not click that. Do not, please. <laughs> do you ever get the emails from your body parts? Like I got one the other day said, from your colon. And it was about, you know, <laughs> blockages. And, you know, it's like, well, uh, you know, that's okay, Mr. Colon. AI, but, uh... AI is out of control. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a bad day when your colon starts emailing you. <laughs> yeah. I got one from my ovaries. I tell, tell boy. <laughs> and the woman who's wondering again why she came back, she is sauntering towards success. We're watching her on the walking uh, the walking platform right now. Dana Onspock's back. How are you? I am doing great. And uh, I am feeling wealthy because I got to take an hour off in the middle of the day to actually run a personal errand, which is very rare. So that was pretty cool. Was the personal Aaron coming to be with us? Is that what yeah. you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, then I had to get here early enough to check on my sound system and make sure it was working. <laughs> uh, Dave just got the new sound system up and running. She sounds great. Also, uh, the the how many how many steps are we gonna log during today's show? Um, let's have an over under. Don't tell us. Don't tell us. Oh, is this gonna be a trivia question? Yeah, don't tell us. We should bet on it. Oh, okay, oh, I'm gee, logging How many the steps, steps you think she's gonna get? Starting now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say, well, that is a pretty tepid pace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm going to say 6,000. No, that seems like 6, a lot. No, I'm going to say 4,000. 4,000. 4,000. 4,000. I changed my mind. 4,000. Len? Well, I, you know, I was going to say 6,000. So I'm going to well, say. You can have uh, six. No, I, I, you know what? Uh, I, yeah, okay. Then I'll keep six. I'm going to keep 6,000. 
Oh, Doug, you get to bet on this one. Yeah, this is, I'm a professional walker. 6,000 steps is three miles, and there ain't no way she's covering three miles in an hour at that pace. Uh, I'm going to go with, well, oh, gee, where did you, you went four. down to 4,000, right? I went right? down to four. Yeah, yeah. You went to four, so I'm going to go uh, 39.99. Oh, oh, taking the under. Well, I'm I'm going 2,000. I'm oh, going, you're in on this? I should have gone 39.98, oh, gee. Damn it. I should have got thirty nine ninety eight. Is what I should have done. And that's the way you, you solve it. solve Doug's trivia question. You know, I think I'm going to do that. I am going to yes. do that. You are thirty nine ninety eight. I'm thirty nine ninety eight. Where? So I got to be dead on at thirty nine ninety nine to win it. Do I get a guess right. in this trivia? Oh well, you, but you've got the controls, Data. Data's like, yeah. I, I was just going to ask, see... like, do I have to stay at this pace, or could I be subtly adjusting All the pace? All of a sudden, she's she jogging. Know. <laughs> 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 and the show's about to end, and Data's in a it, huge it, sprint. Dead sprint. <laughs> Don't forget, Dana. I control the real trivia. I can make this worth your while. <laughs> if you can nail it to thirty nine ninety nine. Uh, this is not the real trivia question, but Dana, Dana, how many think you're going to walk? Well, I have an advantage. I know how many I normally walk, but I'll guess, you know, 2470. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's why I was going to say 2000, Doug, right there. I was going to say 26 initially, and I thought, why be specific? If I wasn't so interested in blocking you, it would have gone much better. We've got Dana Onspach here. We've got Len. We've got OG. We're talking about getting miserably rich on today's show. But before that, Dana, what's the motor in in that machine like? Well, let me tell you all about the motor. Wow, that's fascinating, Dana. Wait, you didn't just play a commercial while I was telling you about it, did you? Well, we wouldn't do that. Keep explaining. What else is cool about the motor? Well, as I was saying, the motor is so quiet. It's like a whisper. That is amazing. Didn't you guys think that was amazing? It is. Does it take unleaded or leaded gasoline, Dana? <laughs> you know, good old fashioned electricity. <laughs> oh, wow. If you'd have been listening, Doug, during that whole thing, you would have known. All right. We got uh, Dana here. Len, OG, let's uh, let's dive in. Our piece today comes to us from the blog of Tony Isola. Uh, Tony is a certified financial planner working at this little company called Ritzholtz Wealth, Wealth Management. Never heard of it. No idea. That's a joke for people who, who don't know. Big, uh, big uh, firm, uh, respected firm. And Tony has written this piece about how to avoid becoming miserably rich. The good news stackers, you don't have to have read this piece. Uh, we're actually going to just kind of use this as a jumping off point. But when Tony talks about becoming miserably rich, he starts off here. He asked, would you prefer being special rather than happy? And before you read this, Dana, we'll start with you. Special or happy? How would you describe yourself? Going for special or going for happy? I'd say going for happy. How come? Why not special? You know, when I think about the decisions I've made in my life, they were always things that made me, you know, like light up, if you want to think of it that way, right? Like, what are the activities that engage me, that I have energy for, that I want to do more of. We call them shiny. So, you know, you're going along and you all have the boring stuff you need to do, but then sometimes there's those shiny things. So I've always pursued those shiny things. And so to me, that would really fall under the, the happy category. But you never find like in your job serving clients, like you find that you want to be the, the, the special snowflake financial planner that nobody else can get anywhere else? You know, I don't think that's ever what I set out to be. Now, maybe I think I'm that today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, it was never my goal. It was always around, you know, I started in this business back when there were really pat answers to things and it was very much a sales culture. And, and so I always wanted to quantify things. I wanted real answers. I wanted spreadsheets that would actually show people if they should pay off their mortgage or not pay off the mortgage. And so for me, it was all around, like, how do you find real answers to these things? It was 
was never about being special. Although at the time that approach was special, <laughs> you know, unfortunately you yeah. start off in the early nineties, right? That wasn't the way financial planning was done. No, I learned sales funnels in the early nineties. Like it exactly. was all about how do you do the Ben Franklin close with people? <laughs> wow. Franklin I don't, don't know that one. Oh, you draw, you draw this line and you got all the positives and on one side and the negatives on the other. And you say, Dana, this is a tough decision, right? To buy permanent life insurance or a loaded mutual fund. And, and you'd say, we'll put all the reasons you should have life insurance here. And, and, and by the way, I would phrase the question. I learned how to phrase the question very one-sided. So we'll put all the decisions that are for having life insurance on one side and all the reasons against on the other. And this is Ben Franklin said this is how he made decisions, right? He just, you, you make it not emotional. So what do you think all the reasons are you should do the right thing and have insurance versus all the, you know, loser things where you don't have insurance? Which, which, which one should you go with? It was horrible. Hold on. You used that shtick on me. <laughs> look at I the time. I remember that. <laughs> look, look at the time. Yeah. Len, how about you? Special or happy? You know, when I was younger, it was special. Um, and it took a little bit of life experience to realize that was, for me, the wrong path. And uh, when I was in my early 30s, I, I finally realized, you know, happiness. Be, it, much better to be happy than special. And, uh, I, you know, ironically, once I did that, the, the part about being special kind of – it kind of uh, came later after I decided I wanted to be happy. Special took care of itself. Yeah, special took care of itself. Yep. That's wild. OG, oh, how about you? I'm still probably where uh, Len was in his early 30s, in my uh, mid 40s. Like, like the transition, I think, f to doing and being the thing that you want to do and be and become, as opposed to just focusing on all of the other stuff. And and it's hard for me to kind of think of the word special, you know, for, and happy. Like those two things to me don't look like parallels, or you know what I mean. Like like either are. deciding between those two things, but. But the way that Len explained it, you know, like having to actually choose it, that's for me, that's an active struggle, I think, to want to focus on the happiness part of it, because I'm not generally a very happy person. Wow. Fooled me. We, we, <laughs> we, but, but what's funny is, is that uh, you and I get coaching from Strategic Coach, and it really is yeah. this, this thing here, really yeah. focusing on happy versus versus being yeah, it's not special. To say I'm not happy. I mean, just, I'm, I'm much more pragmatic, I think. And yeah, but and, I think and, don't you think that that the lessons you and I have learned through the coaching we've gotten has led us toward the happy bucket? Yes. And like Glenn said, the the you know, those two things kind of merge together. If you're doing all the stuff that you enjoy, then you're not going to be in the space that's the not happy space, I guess. I don't know, you know, and that's and that's kind of around unique ability. So Stacker, if you're if you're sitting here with us going, I don't understand why this is important and what this has to do with anything. Tony opens this up by saying people who choose to be special gravitate toward addiction. There's actually studies that have shown this. These aren't the poor souls sleeping in cardboard boxes on a San Francisco street. They're not down and out consuming drugs to avoid the reality of mental illness or a miserable life. Quite the opposite. These are people that are addicted to hardworking, being hardworking, being successful and being wealthy. He points to Arthur C. Brooks, who uh, dives into the weeds in his book, From Strength to Strength. Have any of you read this book? I haven't read it. Uh, but he, uh, Brooks says, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the likelihood of drinking rises with education level and socioeconomic status, meaning as we get wealthier and as we have more high ranking positions in a, in a workplace, we end up self-medicating with alcohol, including drinking at hazardous levels, which can turn off the sensation of anxiety like a switch temporarily. Uh, have you guys seen this in, in your own life, Dana? Have you seen this with people? I, I've definitely seen this. Um, you know, I don't think I ever had a drinking problem, but I don't drink at all anymore. And I certainly used to drink more. And it's night and day difference in the way I feel have more energy. Um, and I, you know, when I think about in my thirties, 
probably drinking was somewhat of a, you know, way to turn off the anxiety in social situations. It's just, so I agree with that sentiment and I've certainly seen it with clients. You know, I had one client we actually terminated because he showed up visibly not sober for several meetings. And so wow. we were, you know, it became almost dangerous to my staff. And, and so we said, you know, politely, we had to find a way to say, you know, we can't serve you anymore. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that that there's a lot of truth to that. But I think, Dana, how prevalent this is. I just remember you talk about starting in the early 90s. I mean, I remember that song in the late 80s, the Loverboy song, Everybody's Working for the Weekend, right? Like like Friday, you've had so much stress. What do you do? You go get loaded because you're getting rid of the stress of having a high-pressure job. Yep. Yeah, you want to turn it all off. It's the end of the day, and you, you know you've got a bajillion things running through your head. You're still thinking about it, and that makes it easy. You know, give me a glass of wine, give me a vodka. Red Bull was my drink of choice if I was going out. Yes, <laughs> I still have those days from time to time. By the way, where I'm like, I just want to, I just want a glass of wine. The self medication. Um, but uh, Len, how about you? Um, I, in early in my career, I saw a couple uh, people who were alcoholics at at the job office, but uh, they were, they were older gentlemen and they weren't, they weren't management types. They were just rank and file. I don't know what the cause of that was, but the, you didn't see this people, people high up in your organization that were well, big drinkers. Or, oh. No. So what I, I was going to continue on is, is, you know, throughout the rest of my career, usually the people, you know, the high up the, the C-suite people, uh, they were definitely workaholics. There's no doubt about that, but all of them, I never saw any of them really have a drinking issue, but, they had lots of Maylocks on their desk, almost all of them. I big from the stress, and What's I would a say Maylocks like uh, antacid, like you know, Tums. Oh. For Tums. Tums. Okay, I, mean, Tums. I never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh yeah, they use. almost all all of them had it on their desk, a, a bottle of it sitting on their desk because they I, probably had ulcers. Was, they had yes, because it was high stress, and I would say of the ones that I was aware of, I would say at least. Two out of three of them had broken families where um, they were married and they were divorced or they were, you know, they had marital problems or, you know, they were mo married multiple times um, just because their family life suffered greatly from all the work that, that they were putting in, which was insane. And, you know, a lot of them expected us to do the same when we were working with them. And it is, it's very, it, that was stressful on me as well, but uh, I didn't buy into you know, I didn't follow follow them over the cliff. Oh, gee, there was a guy who had a who had a really big practice where you and I began our career that that we both knew really well. I don't know if you ever knew that he was just a raging alcoholic, um, but but he definitely was when I got closer to him. Um, but did you see did you see many people during your career that were self medicating? I think, uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. And I knew about, uh, many people and, um, and I think it was part, it's weird because it's, I was going to say it was part of the culture, but then I was just thinking about, um, the stuff at the waste management open a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah. I, I don't know if you guys followed any of that, but it got crazy. I mean, it's always kind of the party thing anyway, but it, it, it got to the point where they had to shut down you know, uh, alcohol sales completely across the golf course. People are running on the course and doing snow angels in the bunkers during the, you know, while the pros were playing it, like it went from being like this fun party atmosphere to somebody tipped it over the edge. And then the whole, you know, the whole group followed that. And, and, you know, obviously in retrospect, people are talking about it like, okay, that was a bridge too far. And, but leading up to that, was very acceptable of all of the behavior and, and and largely it's done because it's fueled by you know whether it's alcohol or drugs or or you know trying to be famous on tv or whatever it is but but all of that comes with that liquid courage and and you know there's nothing there's nothing good that came from it on the back end i, I the phrase that i heard recently was there's nothing good that comes that happens at a nightclub after midnight <laughs> Like it's all downhill from there. You know, gee, the the waste management open. It, it was so bad that they've already changed the name of it for for next year. 
It's going to be called the Wasted Management yes. Open. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yes. And that's right now, in Dana's backyard. I think I, it were is you participating? 10 minutes from my house. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, no, uh, I wasn't yeah. there. You know, I, I used to go. I stopped going years ago. You know, it if, just got it's just got crazy. Yeah, it, it went out of control this year. It was kind of an, an accepted thing. And I think when, you know, in the industry or in many industries, you know, our experiences on the financial planning side, but, you know, the finance, wealth management, the, the like it's, it's, it's frowned upon to not do those things. Len, like you were talking about, you know, and the boss is staying late and says, hey, well, let's, let's run out real quick and have a drink. And you're like, dude, it's 830, man. Like I got, I got to go home and say hi to my, my kids and get to bed because I got to do this crap again tomorrow at seven. And, you know, that, that just kind of as a self-fulfilling prophecy back to the Maalox or Tums or whatever it is. So sadly it was, well, Pretty, Look at Wolf pretty, of Wall Street, right? If you grew up in this business in the '90s, I, I you know, I worked at a big brokerage firm um, in in the late '90s, and that culture was insanity. But it was exactly yeah. how you just described it, OG. I mean, yeah. you know, it was all about the party. It was party. nuts. Yeah, yep. more, 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 more. Make as much money as you yeah. can, more. And, and party your way around it. Yeah, I remember having a conversation, Joe, just to have a kind of put a point on this in terms of the, the, from a culture standpoint, I remember having a conversation with, with one of our sales leaders who legitimately said, you need to go buy something you can't afford right now so that you're motivated to sell this month and not like go buy, you know, don't go buy like a nice watch. He's saying buy, buy something that's going to have, a, yeah, go buy a Porsche because that thing's going to have a thousand dollar payment every single month. You're going to have to work your tail off to afford it. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had a regional vice president that came in for my brokerage firm who slammed his fist down on the table. There was three of us that were in our first few months. And he said, I want you all to know, no matter what you do here, it will never be enough. Yeah. And that was, you know, that more, 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 exactly Glenn like Gary, you're Glenn describing. Ross, right? Coffee Always is for closers. Be closing. Well, yes. and, and that gets to the point, Len, what you were talking about was not seeing the alcoholism, but seeing the thing that Tony's really focusing in on here. Because when he's talking about being miserably rich, sure, there's signs of it with alcoholism. There's signs of it with excessive uh, partying after hours because of the self-medication. But he goes right to the heart of it with workaholism, he calls it. Workaholism is defined as the compulsion or the uncontrollable need to work incessantly. It is a potential to ruin families without the stigma of cocaine or booze. Many high power business leaders conclude they have no choice but to maintain their grueling schedules. Many can't distinguish their per perceived obligations from being caught in an infinite labor loop. Uh, and the dilemma here is that on one hand, you feel like you have to run after this thing to meet the goal to be special, right? You're clearly not happy. You're chasing special. I need to hit the number to make Dana's boss think I am enough. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm closer than anybody else to enough. And he says that workaholism feeds fear and loneliness and fear and loneliness then feed workaholism. It's this, it's this circular loop. Uh, uh, Len, you must have seen working for a big company, uh, people that are just workaholics, Oh yeah, like I like I said, the the C the, the guys in the C suites especially, and I worked with them a lot, especially when we did proposals. And and this talk about high pressure. And um, when you got put on a proposal, you were expected to put in at least twelve to sixteen hours a day. You were working shoulder to shoulder with, uh, in many cases, you know, the vice president of the company or presidents of the company. Sometimes the CEO would be in reviewing your work. You were on a 60-day deadline usually, um, and you had to do this massive proposal and costing, and, and uh, it was brutal. And you were expected to work weekends, uh, holidays be damned. Um, I mean, and the pressure was you had to win. So you had to win the proposal. And you after you do all that work, if you don't win – then it really comes down on you. So, I mean, it was just brutal. Uh, there were many vacations that I worked. I think I've br brought this up before. I've gone, I went to Hawaii and brought my work with me because I couldn't, the, you know, it was the only way I could, yes, I had vacation time. I had to use it before it went away, but I was still working in my hotel while everybody else, you know, while my family's out 
Wait a minute. You you're know. taking the vacation day because you because have you do, to. Because it expires. Yeah, it goes away, right? If you don't use it, you lose it after at least. But you're, you're, but you're still working during that time. So yeah, you're, you're just, still working. But you're looking out the window and you yeah. see palm trees. Oh, yeah. I, as a matter of fact, I remember uh, there was one – me and another coworker, we both had uh, Hawaii trips that we had made before this proposal came down, but it was too bad. We were stuck. So they allowed us each to go to Hawaii. He was on one island. I was in the other, and we were on a <laughs> conference call you know, in Hawaii working you know, on this proposal – you know, well, it was just it's just absolutely we were both like, can you believe that this is happening to us? But I mean, that's the way it goes. Now, thank God I didn't do that, you know, 365 days a year, whereas most of the most of the C-suite people, that's what they did a lot. So um, they, that was their whole life. You know, that for me, that would be maybe two months out of the year. But it was just a living hell every year. <laughs> We we had a guest on January first, the amazing Eric Qualman, talking about and focus in your life, and about having a client six p.m. on Christmas Eve, and he and his family celebrate Christmas six p.m. Christmas Eve. Client says, "I need this tomorrow morning." Yeah, well, just that, yeah. I mean, that, one that of happens. my one, one of my favorite <laughs> Christmas movies is Family Man. Have you? Seen, I mean, it's pretty Nick Cage. Pretty, quiet movie that uh, didn't really receive a lot of press but um, but yeah the one with Nicolas Cage where it's like the ghost of Christmas past right where where he 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 gets to peek into the life that he could have had had he just not followed the you know the hustle culture or you know whatever kind of the road less traveled type thing and he hates it and then he finally likes it you know at yeah. the end basically well that's a funny thing workaholics think this is the only way yeah. Like I have to achieve this 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 thing at the top of the mountain. Top ten traits. I'm just going to read a few of these. Fifty four percent of workaholics prioritize work over personal life. Fifty one percent worry about work on days off. Fifty percent have it hard to switch off. Forty eight percent check emails during the night. Forty six percent of the first to arrive at work and the last to leave. Forty six percent feel too pressured or busy to take their annual leave at all. Forty five percent skip the lunch break after work. I mean, uh, oh, gee, you got to see this among your clients that as people, it, it, I think as people tend to get wealthier, you tend to see these people that can't spend their money because they're so busy in this circular loop. And I, I think the challenge for that is it, 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 it stops at one point or another. It either stops because there's a health issue. It stops because, you know, there's a family issue. Len was talking about, you know, divorce and, you know, all that other stuff that can happen. Um, it, it stops because they just like glitch out, you know, like I'm out, I can't do it anymore. And then that just slams the brakes on all of the other stuff that's going on from a long-term financial goal standpoint and i think our job is is to is to remind people as they as they go through their life as they are accumulating things and being successful money wise that they're on the right path and and they don't have to do more you know it's great to have extra money and it's great to you know save it and invest it and that sort of stuff it's fine but what's the point of you know living to be a hundred having 20 million bucks in the bank and never have gone to disney it's ridiculously expensive to take your kids to Disney. We went for one day to Disneyland and you know, it was like 1200 bucks for what, I mean, that didn't include the churros, which are like $7 a piece, which were good by the way. You know, that's funny. Cause you, you, speaking of Disney real quick, OG, I, we used to get, my family got the, you know, here in Southern California, we got the, we used to get an annual pass for right. Disneyland for the family. And it was 99 bucks. For an annual pass, you know, per person. And I think that included parking. <laughs> 200 each or 175 or whatever. Tell us more stories about the good old days, Uncle Len. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've got, I've got, I, I know the first time I went to Disney World, it was twelve fifty a, 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 a ticket, $12.50. But, but that was, that was a long time ago. But my point is, is that the the financial piece of the world would go that's ridiculous that's a waste of money you're you know you should invest that and compounded that's you know that that money that you spent turns into you know blah 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 it's like right i got that but i got to hang out with my kids at a yes. cool theme park ride some cool rides eat churros for lunch you know and ice cream sandwiches like you don't get to do that all the time and i would rather trade that and not have as much money like because there's not there's there's no point in having 10 million dollars or five million dollars whatever the number is and not have enjoyed it along the way 
Dana, have you seen this with your clients where, because I would think that at some point, based on what OG is saying, it's got to be hard for some of these successful people to visualize the future. And I know how important we've talked when you've been on the show before about, you know, you kind of got to visualize yourself beyond this work. And I think that a lot of these people would struggle with their planning because they're such workaholics. Yeah, you know, I've probably been lucky to not have seen too much of it because, you know, the nature of people that we attract are getting ready for that transition to retirement. And oftentimes they are in the corporate world and they are they know they're ready to get out. Mm. So they're looking for that plan out. Where I have seen it more is actually with people who are entrepreneurs, um, with people uh, in a few times when I've seen it with my clients, I, you know, I remember a, a doctor client who like, he said to me once, you know, I'm a doctor. That's who I am. I do this and I do that. And if I retire, then what will I be? And, you know, that was the, in his mind, right? He, he goes to work and he, and he's explaining this to me. They call me doctor this, they call me doctor that I get to train the residents. I get to do this. And, and so he just couldn't separate his identity from that. But at the same time, I, I don't think he was unhappy. You know, he and his wife seemed happy. That's where his joy came from. And so he slowly scaled down to four days, three days, two days a week, one day, and then eventually retired, passed away not too long after uh, he totally retired. And so, you know, I, I was reading this article, <laughs> thinking through some of the workaholic things going, oh my gosh, is that me? Is that me? <laughs> I spent the whole thing saying that. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, so I, you know, where I struggle, and as a strategic coach, I, I've been a part of that in the past also, right? I, I love their concept of free days. <clears throat> I think it's super important to have time to refresh and recharge and absolutely have to do that. At the same time, if you do love your work, there can be things like if I have a free day and I don't have something special planned, like an activity that I'm really looking forward to doing, I might get up and think, man, I actually can't wait to go write this article. Now, maybe that sounds <laughs> weird, right? But, you know, so would that be workaholic or is it that's where I, I like to be creative and that's where my joy comes from and, it, you know, and, and all of those other things. So I think there can be the healthy aspect of it and some of the unhealthy aspect of it that that is referred to in the article. But I think it's funny, Dana, because I think it can also, I, I think it can be both. You know, uh, Wes Moss joined us recently talking again. He's been on a, a few times, but talking again about what the happiest retirees know and the fact that they have at least four of these, what did he call them, Len? These super, not not hobbies, but super super pursuits or or, or life pursuits beyond what they do. I think those free days help you stay a little bit more round, well-rounded so that for people like you who clearly love what you do, me, I love doing this, those free days allow me to remember that it's a marathon, you know, and, and these other things kind of make me more well-rounded. Do you have to remind yourself that? Me? Do I have to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Um, but for me, it's like I have to have something I'm passionate enough about on those free days. And so, yeah. you know, it's really interesting. It's it's like, OK, if that's a free day, then I need to go find something I'm passionate enough about to, you know, that I'm going to be engaged and not think, yeah, I don't really feel like doing that. I used to ride motocross and absolutely loved it. Like no problem taking a free day. I'd go out on the trail with my dirt bike any day. And, you know, that was something that was completely engaging for me. Um, um, I've taken up pickleball and I enjoy it. It's not the same as motocross. <laughs> and so That's say, boy, a lot of people are the opposite of you, you know, they can't, yeah. uh, it's almost like CrossFit. How do you know somebody plays pickleball? Don't worry. They'll tell you. <laughs> Don't worry. They'll tell you. <laughs> Coming up in the second half of this, Tony actually talks about the solution to workaholism. And uh, we're going to get to that and talk about on our end, how do we avoid being miserably rich? But before that, at the halfway point of every show, we have this phenomenal contest between our three uh, frequent contributors, Mr. Len Penzo, OG, and Paula Pant. And Dana, every time you're here, you're playing on behalf of Paula Pant, I think. I don't know <laughs> if you've ever been on with Paula. You're always playing the part of Paula, aren't you? I think one time I was on with Paula. One time. 
Well, you're on Team Paula again, which as usual, Dana, has good means good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? I'll take the uh, good news first. Well, the good news is you're going to get to guess last because Paula is reassumed her normal place in last place. Paula has <laughs> one, OG has two, and Len has two. And because Len is our champion... Yes, that hey, means... did you see my my trophy back here? Oh, oh, wait, I haven't got the trophy yet, OG. <laughs> Still waiting. <sighs> oh, that was good. I knew exactly where you were going. <laughs> and by the way, I'm so glad that like three days ago, I finally sent you the, 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 the milk bar certificate. Yes, yes, I got only, it. Thank you. I can't wait to try it out. Only a month after it's you delightful. won. I tasted I it. It kind of it. tasted like paper, though. I thought it would taste a oh, little better, bad. the certificate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no. There's, there's, a, there's an intermediate step, Len. Oh, okay. You know, one, one step. But Len goes first, OG second, and, uh, and Dana, you're going to guess last, which means we just need a question, Doug. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I don't usually play the lottery, but I picked up a couple of tickets this week just in case. My motto has always been, you can't win if you don't play. And I figured I'd finally start applying that to things other than dating. I've heard that most people who win the lottery end up miserable, but there's no way I would let that happen to me. I'd be responsible with my money and yes. only buy yeah, and only buy the things I've always wanted. I've already made a list of things to stick to, just in case. want to be disciplined about this. Of course, I'll add to the list depending on how much I win. But don't worry, I don't want anything crazy for myself kept it modest you know only a rotating bed with pink chiffon and zebra stripes and a bathtub shaped like a clam Duh. and for entertaining something basic like an all red billiard room and a 24 seat dining room with an original oil painting by michelangelo or rembrandt well, actually probably both and of course the backyard's going to need a makeover i'm going to add little touches like grecian statues and s-shaped edges and just three swimming pools crazy maybe add in something you know common man like starting an annual carnival with rides and games and a beer garden and an eagles cover band then i'll make the news for being the lottery winner to be responsible and down to earth with their winnings publishing houses will fight for the right for my story joe's gonna have me on as a guest to teach all of you stackers how to be responsible with your lottery winnings and my memoir will probably become a bestseller i can't wait I can already see it all happening. I got an outfit picked out for when I cash in my ticket oh, and everything. Yeah, again, something small. I'm going to wear a Canadian tuxedo with a bow tie, just like James Bond. Here's today's question. Really? Yeah. It's, yeah. I didn't know there was a question attached to this. I think we're out I of mean, time, I'm, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> You've probably guessed the question by, by now, but just in case you haven't, what is the highest lottery jackpot in U.S. history? Oh, I'll be back right after I see how much it'll cost to add an extension on my house for a video arcade and like a pony training room. It's <laughs> something small, something common man like that. Uh, uh, this is interesting because, Dana, this might be the time. This is recent enough that maybe going last isn't great. We'll see. Len, do you remember? You remember when you won the biggest lottery? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Right down the street from me, there was a – it was one of the uh, – was it Powerball winners? This was maybe four years ago, three years ago. It was huge, and it was it was, um, it was was over a billion. Uh, and it was like right down – there's the 7-Eleven right down the street from me here. So that was where the winner was. And the owner of the 7-Eleven only got, I think, a million bucks for, for still. selling that. But still, yeah, it's pretty that cool. Sucks. That's pretty cool, though, knowing that the uh, winning – ticket was right down the street from me um i i well let's see i'm not giving anything away by saying i know it's over a billion dollars did you say u.s or or just in the world doug um i said u.s okay. i actually believe it may be in the world though. okay uh i but, can't but we will I, say I, u.s it could okay, be the world is, but the question I, is u.s I, I know it's over a billion i know that for a fact but uh, did it Get over two billion recently. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say. Oh, I have two numbers in my head. That it's one. On, oh, I don't know if it, if one got over two billion. I think it probably 
did. I'm going to say two. I'm just going to say two billion dollars, and I'll let two. OG and Dana uh, figure out which side they want to go. Well, OG, you're first. Which side of that are you taking? Well, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, happen to have the winning tickets right here. <laughs> <laughs> Can't win if you don't play. Uh, I, too, remember this. And just for clarification purposes, this is the advertised jackpot, not the after payout. That's right. Yes. This is the the billboard number, not not that. Gross, not net. Not the the present value number. This number was so big, by the way, it was gross, Doug. It was totally gross. Super gross. Uh, I think it's slightly less. One billion seven hundred million 1.7 billion dollars going a little south of it dana what do you think oh this is tough because but even before len said anything my initial reaction was i think it was over a billion but i don't remember it being close to two well i think uh i'm gonna go with 1.6 goes for the under Going so for the under. We've got Dana at 1.6, OG 1.7. Len is at 2 billion, rounded rounded uh, to 2 billion. We'll see who's right in just a minute. Len, you kicked it off with 2 billion and you had a thought. Well, my thought was because remember, I said I had two numbers. And, and now I have to be careful when I do this because, you know, I'm going first. So it's always, you have to kind of, uh, my, my real, my first number was 1.75 billion, which I think is the oh. actual number. But I was trying to play the game. I, I, I think OG's got this one. Uh, OG, do you think you got it? Uh, I've, you know, confidence is what a man feels before he learns all the facts. So. Uh, <laughs> I am, <laughs> and we get reminded that every very week confident right question. now. But we'll see. I was pretty Dana confident last good? week and got hosed, so we'll see. I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. One point seven is a lot, but maybe that was it. Maybe we're about to find out, Doug. Who wins this shindig? Well, I'll get to it eventually, Joe. You just got to sit back and relax and just listen. Just get on the ride. And we and thought Uncle see. Len was bad. <laughs> I know. He always <laughs> chastises me. <laughs> hey there, stackers. I'm daydreamer and future lottery winner, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. During the break, I went out and got a new safe to keep my lottery tickets in until the drawing. I can't risk someone breaking in rifling through the freezer and finding the empty ice cream container that I hide all my valuables in. Damn it. Anyways, today's trivia question is, what is the highest lottery jackpot in U.S. history? The answer, of all the lottery tickets you can buy, Powerball is by far the most popular with nearly 200 million people playing each year. Most people opt for choosing their own numbers, picking everything from lucky numbers to numbers from fortune cookies and even numbers that came to them in a dream. The average jackpot hovers around the $140 million mark. I mean, why bother at that point? But the highest jackpot in U.S. history went to a single winner down the street from Len, who hit it big. How big did he hit it? Well, he hit it for uh, $0.44 billion more than what Dana guessed, $0.34 billion more than what OG guessed, and just $0.04 billion more than what Len guessed because the jackpot was 2.04 billion dollars and that means Uncle Lenny is our winner. Wow. Wow. Was over right. two bills. Wow. It was two bill. It it's a nice start but too bad you can't retire on it. Th- th- that one that one wasn't the one down the street from me though. The one down the street from me was like 1.4 billion I thought. Well, Joe, do you remember the person that we knew that won the Powerball that worked with us? I, I, uh, I remember my client that won. Oh, nope. Wasn't that person. Wow. Uh, I don't remember how much they won because most of it was gone by the time they became my client. <laughs> by the and time they got to you, they yes, pulled a dog. It is, it is actually the only time in my entire career I advocated that my client sue their former advisor. Um, because the advisor had put all of their money into uh, annuities 
which were right at the break point of how much. So there's this commission that Dana, you were alluding to earlier about all these sales techniques. And instead of having one annuity, they had like 35 annuities uh, so that the advisor could maximize the amount of money to them and get this. Then before the surrender charges were over, because these annuities had surrender charges, the advisor was advocating they take streams of income they didn't need out of the annuity, t- triggering the surrender fees and taking the proceeds and putting them in new annuities so that they got commissions on that on as well. Wow. It's a yes. gift that keeps wow. on giving. It was it was it was it was criminal. It, it was completely criminal. I had one where my coworkers. There was a this was right before I got hired into the company, but the coworkers went in. It was right after California had its started its lottery up, and uh, there was like twenty of them went in and they won. Um, and after taxes and everything, they each one got like eight thousand dollars a year for twenty years or something like that. Eight or nine thousand dollars a year for twenty years. So. It didn't make them rich, but they had fun with it, you know. Yeah, that's OG's bar tab. <laughs> I had a client at a CPA firm I worked at, and they had won a lottery that had a 20-year. They chose a 20-year payout. It was over a hundred grand a year, but they came in three years from their last payment. All of a sudden, they had nothing. Oh, right? They had three more no. years of payments. And now they were trying to figure out what to do. And, what? and so it just it stuck with me as like, wow. Always take the lump sum. That way, if you're going to yes. blow it, you blow it all right away. There's never a doubt. <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> I have a cousin who won um, before the multi-state uh, lotteries became a thing. So it was an individual state. And I can't remember if it was Florida or Michigan, but they won nine million. And... The, to me, the funny part of the story, and I've told the story in the show before, but it's been a while, was that I was right in the middle of a three-day off-site with a with senior leadership team of a large company doing a three-day total quality management seminar. Um, it was kind of Dirt. all the rage. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, was, remember that, Len? Yes. Remember oh, that? Yeah. That was all the rage in the er, like early to mid-90s. Yep. So we'd all go to off-site. We're in a hotel room and on... And inevitably, when I when I was doing these things, inevitably, by the end of day one, there were always a couple of doubters who were just grumpy to be there and they hated all of it. And at the end of day one, somebody just got pissed and like, I'm so tired of this. It's all BS. There's no such thing as total quality. It can't be achieved. This is a waste of all of our times. And it just it always brings the room down. And I'd done it enough by then to know it was coming. And he said, it's like winning the lottery. Sure, it's possible, but does anybody in this room actually know anybody who's won the lottery? <laughs> and I had no answer. I go home that night, and on my drive home, I get a call from my mom saying, your cousin just won the lottery. Serendipity. <laughs> wow. I walked in the next day like a badass. <laughs> I was ready for this guy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I know somebody. It was a it was a great thing. Hey, uh, one more thing that always gets me with the lottery. People that play the lottery, especially when it's getting up to, up to like a billion dollars, and people will buy a hundred tickets or fifty tickets. I'm thinking, do you even do statistics? I mean, the difference between you know your chance of winning is one in a billion or ten in a billion. It's still infinitesimal. So why waste all? Just buy one ticket and see if you're going to hit it. Yeah, I mean, well, there you go. Buying an extra ten or hundred of them doesn't really. Yeah, you don't feel ten odds. times the excitement. No, no. Just buy no. a ticket and maybe you'll get lucky. Uh, you know, we'll get lucky if we get to the second half of the show. <laughs> <laughs> the second half. That reminds me of a carnival I went to in Arkansas once. <laughs> second half is brought to you by DepositAccounts.com. Uh, Dana, you know what happens when you go to DepositAccounts.com? I don't know, but I think you're going to tell me. It is amazing how that works. And I will tell you, Dana. You can compare more than 275,000 deposit rates from over 11,000 banks and credit unions all for free. And I have it uh, open right now. If you go to depositaccounts.com, you'll see what it is on the day this is released. We record this a little bit ahead of time. But today, the national average savings account has ticked up to 0.52%, so just over half a percent. That is up to 100 since uh, last week when we looked. (laughs) But the top 1%. If you're in the top 1%, 5.02. So you're either getting five or you're getting only half a percent. You know where you find that? Savings account CDs, checking, money markets, and more. The the top leaders in all those areas at depositaccounts.com. 
All right, let's dive into the second half of this because Tony doesn't just pre- present workaholism as a problem. He also presents a solution. And he says this, how can one avoid being miserable and wealthy? It turns out that redefining the game-winning trophies is a great start. And Dana, he begins with the difference between Western society and Eastern society. Western society says, more things when I die equals more goodness. Eastern society says shedding your things to find your true self is a better way to go. Sounds like he's siding with Eastern philosophy. You agree? I agree 100%. I think simplifying, whether it be your finances or the actual stuff around you, is huge. It's I don't know. You, We've all probably known people, whether you see the hoarder shows. I don't know if you've ever known any personally. I have. And and they have an unhealthy relationship with their stuff, right? There's it's emotional baggage that's coming along with all of this stuff. And so I think it's it's huge to simplify, you know, with clothes. I have a one in one out rule. I probably have the most streamlined closet that out of most females. It's just crazy. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, if I can't see it, I won't know I own it. It's got to, you know, that's it. One in, one out. Mine's not streamlined yet, but it's but it's much, much better than it was just a couple of, I, did, I just said, this is madness. I, I don't know, Joe. I've seen that sweater now three weeks in a row. I think you've got. <laughs> that's because like it's one winter in Texas. Too streamlined. Canada. <laughs> it's a two stream. This is my favorite sweater. That's why, Doug. But the T-shirt under it, which today it's Moxie Cola, is a different uh, different T-shirt every time. Len, Len, after retirement, have you found yourself streamlining or going bigger? Oh no, I'm stream. I've always been streamlined, and I'm still streamlined. And yeah, I probably, if anything, I'm getting more streamlined, even even more. It's it's. I've always been about minimalism, and. Uh, living far below your means, not having a lot of stuff. And uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's great. I, I, you know, I, I know people that used to have, I'll, I'll use my, my late grandma, for example, God, God rest her soul, great woman. But she had, she must've had 200 pairs of shoes in her closet. And I used to think, grandma, you know, how, you don't even get out of the house. Why do you have 200 pairs of shoes? But, you know, I, I, you know, how do you manage that? on top of everything else in your life. I mean, you got the shoes to manage and everything. Else. It's like, it's, isn't it better just to have three or four pairs of shoes and be done with it? I mean, that's just, I, I mean, it's just, it's so easy. You don't have to worry about it. It's, when you have large amounts of things that you have to, there's a management component in there that just complicates things, you know? So I don't know. I remember Sean Mullaney uh, uh, talking about that at a campfire. Sean Mullaney, who is, uh, describes the tax code very, very well for frugal people and talked about the, the tax upside to being frugal and said that, A, you're not buying things at this top tax bracket, right? As you as you earn more and more money, your tax bracket goes up and that last thing you buy at the end that you really didn't need is something that's being taxed in the you know 30% plus range where things down, those original things, your essentials are taxed much, much less. But he said something even more dire, which was if you go into any shopping mall, Len, you go into any store, no matter whether somebody takes care of the stuff or not, someday every single thing in this store is going to be in a landfill. And now I think that every time I go to any mall, I'm like, it's it doesn't it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, every single thing in this mall is going to be in a landfill. And you're like, what's the point? Like, why do I why do I have all this stuff? Oh, gee, I know in your life, the time that we've known each other, you've turned you've turned really much more toward experiences. I remember Tracy McCubbin, the great uh, uh, organizational expert, talking about how stuff depreciates, but experiences appreciate over time. It's a constant struggle <laughs> because I like I like uh, I like stuff. My 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 only addiction is collecting wine right now, which is. Um, so you're working you know, hard to consume it, make kind sure of unhealthy it's... on all fronts, from the from the monetary aspect and, and also the cons- consumption aspect of it. But um, uh, yeah, no, we've st- we've started to spend a lot more attention on this, you know, in terms of in terms of where we're spending our time and where we're spending our money. Um, I went through a went through a thing a couple of weeks ago where I went through all my drawers. You're talking about your closet, cleaned all that stuff out, and then I took all the hanging clothes. 
And I got this trick from, I don't know, some show or something, but flip the hangers around backwards, which annoys the hell out of me, by the way. And you set a timer. So basically six months from now, whatever, you go back into the closet, everything that's still facing the wrong direction, you can take off and send away, donate or, you know, give away. Because if the hanger hasn't switched, you haven't worn it yet. And if you haven't worn it in six months, you're not going to wear it in the next six months. So it's okay to make it go away. So we're we're definitely trying to think about it much more in a simplifier instead of a multiplier type of type of thinking. And that's, I mean, I think that's what I do for um, for work is simplify things. You know, we try to do that for the show. I try to do that for clients. But for some reason in our uh, in our personal lives, it's been a little bit more of a struggle for sure. But um, but at least I'm conscious of it now. Every week I have a poll on my blog that I ask the readers and, and just out of coincidentally, two weeks ago, I asked him this question. Do you believe it's better to direct most of your spending towards experiences rather than material possessions? And there were 1,800 responses. Do you want to care to guess how many people said uh, it's better to spend the money on experiences? 80-20. 80-20? No. It was 50, I had 52% said – only 52%. I thought this was only low. 52. Only 52. That is 52. low. Yeah, and 21 said no, and then the other 27 said they weren't sure. They wow. were on the fence. Isn't that interesting? I really thought the number would be about 80-20 as well. I was yes. really shocked at that. And maybe it's because I've bought into that. I bought into happy more and more where I'm yeah. like, no, it's all about happy, not about uh, special. And, and and buying things has never made me much happier. Dana? I was going to say, I wonder if they interpreted that question, material things, more like art or collectibles or, I mean, for 27%, you know, it just makes me wonder, like, wow, did they understand really what you were getting at? I, I Yeah, I don't know, Dana. It, it was really surprising, though. I was really shocked. Retail therapy is powerful, man. You're sitting there on the couch and you've got an opportunity to buy like a weighted blanket or an automatic cheese straightener. And that's I love my weighted blanket, by the way. Oh. Right. I mean, you get instant <laughs> gratification versus having to wait for nine months and schedule it and then work gets in the way. And next thing you know, you're working when you're on vacation and, you know, Thailand. And so, but you get your little thing in Amazon and you're happy. I don't know. I kind of get it. But I do love when it comes to experiences, what uh, we did a piece from Jonathan Clements, the former uh, well, Wall Street Journal uh, personal finance columnist, where he talked about, Doug, remember this, talked about booking trips way before you go, because part of the deliciousness of the experience is also the anticipation of it happening. I know on your mind a lot, you're about to go on a trip and, uh, uh, in, just, in just a couple of days. And I know you've been thinking about it more and more because I've been hearing about it the last few weeks. I'm worried about it because it like it's almost like New Year's Eve. It This trip can't possibly be as good as what I built it up in my mind <laughs> over the last three months. I'm so excited about it. But uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of endorphins to be had. Endorphin harvesting is what I'm doing right now. Are there's you going to more. Bali? Uh, yeah, I know it because that's what stacking Benjamins people do is go to Bali. I know the bar's high. No. Doug. The bar's high. They they no. don't let me go there. I, you know where I go, Len? Instead of Bali, Idaho. Oh well, that's a, yeah, that's a good place too. That's close. <laughs> Have you ever been same, to Bali, same. Idaho? It's a great town. It's, it's like it's like Paris, Michigan. Can't even be Paris, Texas, which is the second most uh, popular Texas out there. Uh, there's a there's a second piece to this that he has, by the way, which is accolades and pleasing strangers were influential to me a few years ago, like drinking seawater. This desire can never be satisfied. I got to assume, Dana, when your boss said that in the 90s, it will never be enough. There was a piece of you. I mean, y these bosses say this by design that wanted to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to prove you wrong. D when did you make the switch from? No, you're you're, you're like, nope. D were you no, out right away? I, I I remember thinking, oh, my God, what have I done? This oh. is not the place for me. Right. I, you know, I just knew it wasn't the place for me. 
And so, yeah, that for me was just like an instant sinking feeling in my stomach. Like I'm very culture oriented. Like this is like, I want to be happy coming to work every day. Think about how much time we spend at work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of our energy and effort. And so, you know, I want to be happy doing it every day and, and happy showing up there and have people that are feel supported around me. And so for me, that was innate. I mean, I sent myself a postcard when I was like 20 saying, remember, spread a little sunshine everywhere you go. I think it's like my nature, right? It's just like, yeah. that's my nature. Yeah. And so for me, it was instant. Like this place is not for me. So, so, so what do you do uh, to make sure that, that you chase happy? You know, I don't even know if the word chase is right. Um, but like today, I mean, I started this off saying, you know, I got to run an errand in the middle of the day, actually prepping for this, um, you know, this podcast helped me think about that. Like, yeah, you know what? It's okay. Take an hour off in the middle of the day and go get this done. And, and so those are the things of, you know, scheduling time to go play pickleball. We just went up to Colorado and took a few days off and, you know, you have to schedule those things in. I've never been what I call a workaholic. You know, I probably work on average more than 40 hours a week, but rarely more than 50. And so to me, you know, of course, there's those times where client stuff comes up and you got to dig in and get it done. That's what they pay us for. You know, you might be yeah. working all weekend on a big decision that a client has to make. But there's other times where it's like, all right, you know, I'm done at three. I'm going home. So finding that balance. And for us, we encourage our staff to have that balance. We're very supportive. No one has to clock in and answer where they had to be for the last two hours if they need to take their kid to a doctor or you know run an errand or take the car in those are the things that i i think are super important having so autonomy I'm still, I'm still stuck on the fact that she said she prepped for this for this podcast <laughs> I <thought> same thing <laughs> damn what would happen well, if i read I the article uh, I've realized too, Dana, that this is that, that I love what I do, but it's a marathon, and I really despise being here past five o'clock. Like, like past five o'clock, I am, I, I, I want nothing to do with it until seven thirty, eight o'clock the next morning. Like, like that, I'm that I'm back, but, um, but, but it's got to be that, and I don't work hardly at all on Tuesdays, like four days a week, um, and then take a Tuesday to go have that free day and do something else is magic for me. Len, uh, how do you chase happy? And once again, chase might not be the right word. The big revelation for me was to stop. And, and he talks about it and Tony talks about it in, in his article. You, you stop pleasing others and, and, and please yourself first. I mean, that really is, that's what turned everything around for me in my early thirties. It took me until I was about 32 to figure out, stop. I, everything I did was to please others until around 32, the switch went off. And I said, this is, you know what? It, it's my life. I'm going to do what's good for me and what makes me happy. And and it, everything changed when I changed that mindset for me. Uh, that was that was huge. Now, the one thing I do want to say about working uh, long, it, it, takes exper it takes experience to know what's important, what's really important and what's not important. So I know when mm. you're first starting off at work, you you might say you, you might not know uh, when it's for staying extra uh, at work. You know, do I have to stay two or three extra hours at work today? It, sometimes that takes experience to know whether you really do. Um, if you're not sure, stay at work. But over time, it won't take too long. But within a year or two, you'll start figuring out: is it really important? Do they really need me today? to stay an extra three hours or can it wait till tomorrow? Um, just spend some time. You will learn uh, the longer you work what's truly important. Most of the time I would say in my job, I'd say 85% of the time if somebody said, hey, we need you to stay an extra hour or two, I realized, no, that's not true. The, the, the place is not going to come crashing to the ground if we wait till tomorrow morning to, to pick it up. So um, try and do – just try and figure out discerning what's truly important. Most of the time, it's, it's the really – it's very rare that you actually have to be there for an extra hour or two. It can wait. It's, it's so funny, Len. Same for me. Early on in my career, it was what goes on the task list, and now increasingly it's what comes off. Yep. Like what is the what yep. is the thing that just I I don't I don't need to do? Uh, OG, how about you? Fencing off happy. Ultimately, I think that um, you know there is a lot of truth to the 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 phrase of you know if you're doing what you like to do, 
then you're not actually, you know, working at all. You know, you're not working a day in your life type of thing. And I think we all know people that um, just continue to do what they want to do. And there is no, you know, there is no end of that because they're doing the things that they want to do. And, um, you know, Dana, you were talking about your doctor client who was doing what he wanted to do. And you're telling that story, Joe, I was thinking about the physician that you and I knew who worked well into his nineties. And I don't know if he was doing it because he financially had to or not, but he's, when we interacted with him, it certainly looked he like clearly he really loved it. He was doing what he wanted to do. He was a Clearly pediatrician to it. our kids when he was 95 years old, and he just loved doing. My grandfather worked when he was 92 years old. He was still at the office. He wasn't working. He wasn't, you know, hauling paper around. <laughs> he was, he was there. He was doing what he wanted to do. So, but you know, it's interesting that he did though at that point because he was he was. I mean, I know enough about this guy, OG, that he's well beyond financial independence not a workaholic. I mean, he, 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 he made it, I think either two or three days a week that he, that he would work. And it was just yeah. to get that love and feeling of doing what he loves to do, you know, Absolutely. just continuing to, yeah. And, and, and that not workaholic. So, so many people are focused on like, oh my gosh, you know, you got to retire when you're 60 or 65 or 70 or whatever. It's like, well, you don't have to, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. The nice thing about planning on working until you're 75, if you're an entrepreneur and you're like, I'm going to keep doing this is guess what? You don't have to save as much money, which means you don't have to work as hard, which means that you can have fun now too. You don't have to, there's like all these great things that come from expanding your time horizon. You know, we've learned in, in, in coach, you know, it's, you underestimate the stuff that you can get done in 25 years and overestimate the stuff that you do in one year. Just take a longer time horizon to get to, to do the math and, and, and it all works out always. So I think, I think Len said it best, just make yourself happy. If you're not, if, if something's not right, just fix it for yourself. The world will still continue to turn. Well, what I found OG was the big uh, paradox. Um, and this is also uh, partly from strategic coach, but just is, has, has been amazing is the, the more I put fencing around my work hours and avoid work, workaholism, the more stuff gets done when I show up at work, the more stuff gets done in my family life, the more the important stuff in my life happens. Yeah, when better I results. Focus on, yeah, when I everything. focus on happy versus impressing other people, all the, all the magic just begins to align itself. Well, I think it's, it's a, saying work, work expands to fill the time allotted. Absolutely. It totally does. And, I, it, and how many of us have known workaholics, Dana, that just, you, you can feel it, but they're so wearing the badge of I work harder than you that um, that you can't convince them that uh, that there might be a better way. Hopefully it's convinced a couple of our stackers, though, to look a better way because there's no sense of being miserably wealthy. Let's uh, I hope that helped you not become miserably wealthy. But I also hope that the things that each of the three of you are doing outside of here is going to help people, too. Well, oh, gee, let's start with you. What do you got going on this weekend, my friend? Uh, we, well, kid, kid, kid stuff like crazy track meets, baseball games. We are elbow deep in spring high school You're sports playing right dead. now. You're being yep. dead. Yep. I'm, yep. Well, I, you know, uh, my middle kid plays baseball and not my most favorite, you know, sport to, to play. I I like, not my, my most favorite kid. <laughs> not my most favorite kid either. <laughs> they're tied. They're all tied for first and last at the same time. It's really weird. Um, you do remind them sometimes they're tied for last, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Who's your favorite? I'm like, well, you guys are all tied for either first or last. You get to decide today which one that is. But uh, but uh, I, I I I weaseled myself into be the being the official team scorekeeper. So I'm learning how oh. to score baseball on an app, and I keep all the stats on max preps. So I'm engaged in the game. I'm watching my kid taking videos of him too, but, but, you know, I got to watch every ball and strike and, you know, so it makes consequently uh, the, the texting volume from OG to it, me has skyrocketed it does. Doug's, since he became a baseball game yeah, guy. And I'm like, wait, tell me the difference between a pass ball and a wild pitch, because I got three of them. I need to score and I don't know what to do. Yeah. So it's fun times. That's what's going on this weekend. Len, what's going on at lenpenzo.com, man. Well, this week, you know, the advantage of having a blog for 
gosh, how many years, 16, 17 years, is I can go back into the archives every once in a while and pull out some gems. And this week I've pulled out one of the uh, all-time great gems where we discussed the day that we went into the mailbox and we got the phone bill. The And the phone bill was normally it comes in a regular little teeny number 10 envelope. This phone bill came in an 8 by 11 manila uh, oh, no. envelope oh, no. and it was about an inch thick and we opened it up and we realized that my son went on a phone call spree this was before they had a, you know all you can talk or whatever plans and uh the bill i'll just the bill was uh 140 some pages and nice. it was a thousand over a thousand dollar phone bill so uh we talk i just Detail the whole story there at lenpenso.com on my son and wow. the thousand plus dollar phone bill. Wow. Yes. A cautionary Not tale. Not a good day at the Penzo <laughs> family house. How soon after that did he end up working at the car wash to <laughs> yeah. cover that? Dana, thanks for hanging out with us again. But uh, I have the very important question how many steps did you walk? Oh, okay, yeah. how many steps? I've got my calculator out. So right now I'm at 4267, but when you asked me, I was at 1457. So oh, oh, it was oh. 2810. Wow, just over your but Dana, you you had inside information. You know how I fast did. you walk, which really means I just beat Doug. That's all that we <laughs> really have to focus on. <laughs> it's the, you guys the real thing. So, so what's going on to Sensible Money? What are you guys doing? You're always doing some workshops, some training, some fun thing. We are. So right now I'm getting ready for our next webinar, which is March. I can't remember the date, maybe the 28th, but it's with Fritz Gilbert, oh. who is the founder of the Retirement Manifesto blog. And his work ties into everything we've been talking about today in terms of really finding purpose and intentionality in retirement. You know, I've never seen anyone write about it as well as he does. And I love this, you know, idea of he set different um want to call it like frameworks around how they were going to approach retirement, things like remain curious, you know, be open minded. And so they had this. That's where his manifesto came from. And and so I get to do some work with him and prepping for our upcoming webinar. And we're going to be talking about a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's fun stuff for me. We we did a uh, a topic of a recent Friday was Fritz. Uh, Len, I think you were yeah, in that two conversation. Weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks yeah. ago. We, we covered it. Yeah. Yeah, talked about um, talked about the uh, the planning beyond the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, planning for all the emotional stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. And uh, people can find details though at sensiblemoney.com. I assume they can. They'll find the webinar on sensiblemoney.com. Scroll to the bottom left, you'll see it. Awesome. And if you're walking the dog right now, you know what? Just go to our website, stackybenjamins.com. and hit the uh, show notes link for today's show, and you'll find both. Uh, what Dana is up to with Fritz and Len Penzo's amazing thousand bajillion dollar <laughs> phone bill story uh, there as well. All right. That's going to do it for today. Let's put a bow on this, Doug. Uh, what's on our to-do list today? Well, Joe, here's what's stacked up on our to-do list today. First, take some advice from our panel. Hoping to be special, maybe happy is a better move. Second, Take some advice from me. If you're not happy with what you've got, you're not going to be happy with what you're going to have. Happiness comes from within. But what's the biggest to do? Always make sure you set the code on a new safe before you lock your valuables inside. Otherwise, you're going to have to haul your safe down to the 7-Eleven to claim your millions. Thanks to Dana Onsbach for joining us today. You can find out more about Dana at sensiblemoney.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at lenpenzo.com slash telephone bills. And thanks also to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. The show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Salcihai. 
Our producer is Karen Repine. This show is written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, Kate Youngkin, Karen Repine, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course you do, but you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of the show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing going for this podcast. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude, Stacy Doe, and Julia Garib are our social media coordinators. And Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. For more interactive fun, join us on Instagram every Tuesday and Thursday for our Instagram Lives. Kate Yonkin and Joe host those weekly. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Boy, am I glad our lawyer made us say that. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.